question to start out the lesson this morning. What are you looking forward to? What are you looking forward to? Maybe in the immediate context, maybe you're looking forward to something going on today, maybe you're looking forward to something going on this week. But more substantially than that, what are you looking forward to in the future? As you consider that question for yourself and in your own life, let's begin our lesson by looking at the book of Mark in chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 24, was something that Jesus said. Now, in the, in the context here, Jesus had previously gone into the temple. He had gone into the city, and he had overturned the tables in the temple, and there was not a, a great reception of Jesus as he forcefully corrected them in their behavior. He comes out of the city, though, and he goes to Mount Olive, and he is preaching to them a message about something that's going to happen in the future. At the beginning of chapter 13, he's talking about how the temple is going to be destroyed. That's something they need to be looking forward to, something they need to be aware of, events that are about to happen in their life that they need to know about. And then he transitions in verse 24 to talking about something that every single one of us need to be looking forward to. And he says, but in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. He's talking about his return. He's talking about how he is going to come back, and he's going to come back with power He's going to come back in a cloud. And as he comes back with his great power and glory, in verse 27, he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now, Alan talked about Revelation last week. And as we've recently got done studying the book of Daniel, and as we've just gotten done studying about the book of Zechariah, this word here that he uses is a direct reference to these apocalyptic kinds of messages. The four winds of the earth, the four corners of the earth. It really just highlights again how far-reaching and far-stretching God's domain is over this world. And when Jesus comes again, he's not just going to single out a small localized group of people. He's going to call all men from all corners of the earth to himself, all of the elect. This is something I'm looking forward to. I hope you are. I hope we all look forward to this time when our Lord comes again and calls us all home. Jesus is giving them a message here, though, about looking forward to this time. And the words that he uses in verse 26, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, it's almost like that song we just sang. Lift up your eyes and see his great might. Lift up your eyes and see the coming of the Lord again. And so he's encouraging them with these words of hope and what is going to happen to them in the future when he comes again by telling them to look up. And that is a, a familiar kind of phrase. Lift up your eyes. What we're going to do this morning is we're concluding our series on the Minor Prophets, and we're going to go book to, back to the book of Zechariah. And I don't know how we time this thing so well with our Bible classes, but we're going to do it again. We're going to talk this morning, both myself and Alan, we're going to divvy up the book. Now, I don't know, I think I pulled a lot in the, in the whole idea here about picking which chapters I wanted to preach on. Alan gave me the choice, like Abraham gave Lot the choice of what land he wanted to live in, and I chose chapters 1 through 8. Chapters 1 through 8 are weird, super weird. And as I started to get into this lesson, I kind of regretted my decision to take on chapters 1 through 8, but we're going to make it, make it work anyway, hopefully. But the word that is often used here, the phrase that's often used throughout the book of Zechariah, lift up your eyes, especially in reference to these visions. You see, just like we today have something to look forward to in the coming of our Lord, the children of Israel had something to look forward to in the coming of their Lord. 
they had something in the future to look forward to, and that was the coming of the kingdom, the establishment of God's reign over his people, and all of the hope and all of the encouragement that would come through that. They were looking forward to lifting up their eyes to this time. And as you read through the book of Zechariah, it is a roller coaster. Hardly anything follows a single train of thought. You're jumping around from here to there. It's this, we're going to talk about it in a second, but it, a lot of the book is centered around this chiastic pattern. Now, if you want to know anything more about that, talk to Don Johnson. He'll be happy to tell you all about the chiastic pattern. But the chiastic pattern is a, is a poetry tool that's used quite often, and it hones us in on what is most important. It focuses us in what is the main idea, and that is how Zechariah is written, pretty much from the beginning of the book all the way to the end. And so it's, it's full of words of encouragement, full of, of consolation, full of hope, looking forward to a time when things are going to be better, when things are going to be whole, and when the Lord again will dwell among his people. And so let's look at that this morning. Let's lift up our eyes and see how amazing God is. He's not just amazing now, he's always been amazing. There, I'm going back to my last lesson. He's always been amazing, and he is today. And so let's begin here. We're going to do a brief outline of the book. Chapter 1, beginning roughly about verses 1 through 6, he has this call. He has this charge to give them. And he says in verse 2, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets cried out, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? Oh, we know where they are. Zechariah is writing right about at the end of the 70-year captivity in Babylon of the people. They are about to go back to Jerusalem. They're on their way back in waves. And he is telling them, you need to focus your hearts on returning to the Lord. Now, I love the book of Haggai. And we studied the book of Haggai recently. Haggai is, if you could go back to one of my lessons a little while ago, Haggai is sort of the how and the what. You need to build the temple. You need to get to work. Here are the practical steps that you need to take to, to make this thing happen. Do some stuff. Zechariah, for the most part, is the why book. Zechariah is focused on the heart. Zechariah is focused on their inner man, shoring them up, giving them hope, giving them encouragement, and giving them reason to do all the things that they're about to do in serving the king. And so Zechariah here, God through Zechariah, is telling them, come back. And to their credit, it appears that they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so he has dealt with us. They repented. And good on them that they did that. Very few of the minor prophets that we've studied about had anything to do with repentance. Now, there was a lot of messages to repent, but very few times do they actually seem to do it. And so we move on here to the beginning of the eight visions. And like I said, these are weird visions. Super weird. A lot of them are so weird, it's kind of even hard to, to summarize them in any meaningful way, but we're going to try to do that this morning. Now we know that God has for many, many years spoken through visions to his people. And that is exactly what he's doing here in the time of Zechariah. He's giving him these visions He's helping him see some things behind the scenes. Alan's title of his lesson last week was Pulling Back the Curtain. And that is what I want us to see here in these visions. There's stuff going on behind the scenes that you or I may never, ever know about. God is doing some amazing things behind the scenes. And Zechariah is getting a picture into that in these visions. What is happening? What is God doing in this, in this apocalyptic kind of signifying language that he uses. So we're going to study through these things, and not only are they focused on the current events of the day, but they are also focused on events that are going to happen in the future. Now I mentioned the chiastic pattern, but let's start with vision one. Vision one is of four horses, four horses that go throughout the whole earth. They're patrolling the whole earth for, the, for God, and they're looking 
and they report back and say all the earth remains at rest in chapter 1, verse 11. They're going throughout the whole world, they're patrolling, and they have a report that things are at peace, things are at rest. And we can see from this vision that God judges all nations. There is not one nation that God does not judge. There is not one corner of the earth that God does not control or patrol. God judges all nations, and not only that, but he shows mercy to his people. He says to them how he is going to show them mercy and how he is going to return to them and how he is going to, to love them. In verse 16, he says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Now, we'll read a little bit more about this measuring line in a little bit. What an encouraging message, though. As, as the children of Israel are in Babylonian captivity, the Lord is saying, I, I'm in control over everything. I have my hand in everything. And oh, by the way, I'm returning to you. That's, that's a comforting message. That's a message of hope. That's something they should be looking forward to. But then, as we talked about in this chiastic pattern, we jump all the way to the eighth vision. And these two are tied together, and you can see that, even in just the imagery that is used. You get this sense here from chapter 6, beginning in verses 1 through 8, of these four horses again, and their chariots. And they patrol all the corners of the earth, from north to south to east to west. They go throughout the whole world. And one of them comes back and reports that in the north country, in verse 8, the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. So this vision of these horses going out into all four corners of the earth again highlights the fact that God is in control over everything, all four corners of the earth. Now, if we just stopped here, this might be a data dump. This might be just a, a transfer of information. But let's, let's get down to brass tacks here. What should we know? We need to lift up our eyes and see that God brings either peace or judgment to all men. All men. God is in the affairs of all men. And either you will be at peace with him and experience his peace, or he will judge you and punish you as he talks about in these visions. That's the choice. There's no third option here. <laughs> There's no getting out of this judgment or peace from God. He sees everything. He knows everything. And that's what we see in these two visions as they're paired together. So let's move on. We go to the second vision, and this is of four horns. And these four horns represent the four nations who had scattered Judah across all the nations from Jerusalem. And then we see these four craftsmen, these four blacksmiths here. And they create essentially a weapon that is able to destroy these four horns. And so what we see from this is that God is going to remove all of Israel's enemies. God's going to remove their enemies. He's going to wipe out their enemies. He's going to take away all those people who scattered them, all the people who oppressed them. He's going to wipe them out. And if you're Israel right about now, if you're Judah right now going back to Jerusalem, doesn't that bring you a lot of comfort? Doesn't that bring you a lot of hope? All these people who had oppressed us and taken, a, taken an advantage of us, God's in control and he is going to destroy them. And he certainly would. That's a message of hope. But then we go to the seventh vision in this pattern. The seventh vision, and this is probably one of the weirdest ones. We see here in chapter 5, beginning in verse 5, this woman in a basket. The woman has a name, and her name is Wickedness. But she's in a basket. And what's on top of the basket? Well, it's this lead cover, this lead weight that's on top. And two women with, eagle, or with stork's wings fly the basket away to Shinar, which, for those unfamiliar, is a reference to Babylon. Taking the sin of Israel away to Babylon. And they put it up there on a, on a pedestal, and they worship it like an idol. And this here is a, is a picture, a symbol of how God is going to remove all of Israel's sinfulness. Not only is he going to remove 
their enemies from them, but he's going to remove their sinfulness. He's going to take all of their idolatry, he's going to take all of their worship to other gods, and he's going to fly that away to Babylon, where they'll be happy to take it in. They'll be happy to worship idols. But no longer will that be tolerated amongst God's people. And so, again, as we look at these two visions, what do we understand? Well, we need to lift up our eyes and see that God will protect his people from evil influences. This is not just you going out, going out on your own. This is not just you standing strong against the evil one. This is not just you pushing back when evil comes upon you. God is behind the scenes and God is working for you. God is working to bring evil influences out of your life. He's working to bring evil people out of your life. He's working to help you overcome sin. You don't have to be strong enough in and of yourself to be able to, to tackle sin. God is there to help. God is doing that work for you. And in your life, if you will assert yourself and commit yourself and lift up your eyes to see the good work that God is doing for you, you're not alone in dealing with your sin, and neither were the children of Israel. And this brings a lot of hope, again, and encouragement. God's going to take care of them. He's going to watch out for them. And then we go to the third vision here. In chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, we see this picture of a measuring line, a plumb line. And we know what this kind of, of device or this tool does. It measures things. It makes sure that they're straight up and down, that they're within the acceptable tolerances and limits. But somebody's going around and he's measuring the, the walls of Jerusalem. And what, what do they finally wind up saying? Well, they say in verse 4, Run, say to this young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and the livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord, and I will be the glory in her midst. When they go back to Jerusalem, yes, Nehemiah will rebuild the walls. And they're not, I don't believe he's talking about physical walls here. I believe what... God is talking about in this vision is saying, I will be there to protect you. No amount of physical walls, physical security is ever going to make you strong, but I'll be there to protect you as a wall of fire about you, and I'll be in your midst. Now, that, that is hope. That is encouragement. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to the time where God is blessing me with his presence and with his protection. If I'm the children of Israel back here, I'm gaining a lot from that. And so we see that God is going to be with them. He's go going to care for them. And then we see in the sixth vision, in chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, we see this scroll. It's a two-sided scroll, and it's a huge scroll. It's giant, and it's flying through the city. And what is it doing? It is defeating anyone who steals and swears falsely. It is going through the streets and it is wiping out, it is, it is defeating anyone who is breaking the commandments of God. God is not just promising that he will bless them and be with them and protect them. He's also saying, I'm going to punish those who refuse to obey my law. It's not just about all the blessings, all the protection. On the other side of that coin is punishment for anyone who doesn't follow. And again, you go back to chapter 1, you go back to the beginning, as he, as he started out this conversation, don't be like your fathers. Don't be like your fathers long ago who heard the word of the Lord but refused to do it, who committed these abominable acts, who sinned in the sight of God, even though time after time they were told to come back. God is saying, I'll be with you but you need to obey me. You need to follow after me. And, and keep in mind here, these two commandments that he's talking about were two of the Ten Commandments. They should have been following these things. They should not have been stealing from one another or lying. But this flying scroll that flies through the city will take care of those who practice evil. And so again, as we lift up our eyes, we need to see that God dwells amongst his people when they walk faithfully. And that is a lesson for you and I today, isn't it? God dwells with us. He dwells among us. He protects us. 
He offers His presence to us if we're following Him. And you can go to the book of Revelation in the beginning there as Jesus is walking through the lampstands and He's going to take some of them away because some of the churches would not follow. I think it applies today just like it applied back then. God will be with us. Jesus will be with us if we follow Him. This is basic stuff. It really is. But as you look back to the children of Israel, they had a really hard time with this. And so do we, if we're honest with ourselves. So do we. We want the presence of God. We want a relationship with God. But do we really want it enough to give up our, our old lives of sin? I hope the answer is yes. Because that's what he's encouraging them to do as they return back to Jerusalem and experience this relationship with God again. The last pair of the visions here is in chapter 3. The fourth vision is a vision now which, as I said, a chiastic pattern kind of hones us in on what's most important. And you can see at the center, visions 4 and 5 really are the most important ones. <laughs> They're the most immediate ones. They're the most critical ones for them to understand. And we see here Joshua the high priest in this vision. And he is standing beside Satan and Satan is accusing him. Joshua, who was the high priest at the time, he's wearing dirty clothes. He's wearing dirty robes. He's the high priest. He should not be wearing dirty clothes. He should be pure and holy, but he's wearing dirty clothes in this vision. And so he is given clean clothes. He's given a, a pure garment to replace his filthy garment. And we see in verse 4, he's, uh, and it said to him, Behold, I have taken away your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with pure vest vestments. Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with white garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua. And this is the most important part of this, I think. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If, this is the first time we've used that word, I think, here in this lesson and emphasized it, if you have a choice, you are, now, you are now at an impasse. You are now at a crossroads. You've got to choose, Joshua the high priest. If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. It's conditional. It's conditional on Joshua the high priest to be pure. And we know from the history of the children of Israel that the leadership, the priestly leadership, was rarely ever pure, pure. And God is telling the leadership there, be pure. Get back to where you need to be. And then he talks about the branch, which is this foreshadowing of Jesus as, as he talks about him here. Verse 8, Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit here before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone which I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. Now, if that doesn't tell you about the death of Jesus on the cross, removing the iniquity of the whole earth in a single day, I don't know what does. He's saying it very clearly here. He's pointing forward. Jesus, who would be our pure high priest, the branch, he's coming. And if you're faithful, you can herald his coming. And so that's a charge for Joshua, but it's also a charge for us because we need to understand God is, has sent his high priest to purify them of their sins. And that's what he does for us. That's what Jesus does for us as our high priest. And you can look at the book of Hebrews, you can find a lot more information about the high priest there, how Jesus is our perfect high priest, but he purifies us from our sins, and we see that here in this vision. And then we go to the fifth and final of these eight visions, and we see Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the governor of the time. He was of the line of David. And this really weird picture of a golden lampstand and these two olive trees that are producing olive oil down into this lampstand with a series of pipes. And, and then they look and they see the temple being rebuilt. 
we could really focus an entire lesson on this vision. It's, it's a pretty powerful vision. But we're not going to, because I'm going to assume in the last five minutes of class, probably you got to this vision when we talked about it on Sunday. But this is specifically talking about the time where the temple is completed and the priest king lights the nation. He's beginning here a narrative about how the office of the priest and the office of the king were going to be combined together in one, work together to bring light to the world, and how the temple was going to be completed. Now hold on. Remember when we started this lesson, we looked at Mark chapter 13? Remember what Jesus said was going to happen to that temple? It's going to be destroyed. The temple is going to be destroyed. Now wait a second. Here he's telling them the temple is going to be built. And if you look here in this, in this vision, as he's talking about these things, he says in verse 6, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You're not going to accomplish all of this great work in this world by your own might, by your own power. You're going to accomplish it by my spirit. And that's a conditional. If you don't trust in my spirit to accomplish all the work that you're doing here in building the temple and in building a nation of faithful servants, if you don't focus on my spirit as the motivator for all of that, then I'm going to bring you down. And I think in a sense... In Mark chapter 13, that's the beginning of when Jesus is saying, you didn't listen. You didn't listen. Nation of Israel, now you'll be brought down. And so he continues this idea of conditional statements, this idea of them having to follow the Lord to experience all of these blessings in the first place. And so, again, we need to lift up our eyes and see that God will purify us by his Son and make us lights in the world. That's what God wants of us. He wants us to be pure in this world. He wants us to be lights in this world. He wants us to shine in this dark world. But only through the power of his son, the branch, the great king and priest. And speaking of the king and priest, we have a bonus vision at the end. We have a bonus vision here at the end in chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. We see this vision of... Joshua, the high priest, and they're told to go put a crown on him. Now, that sounds a little strange, and if you know anything about Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews, you kind of are starting to make connections. The priest was not supposed to be the king, because who was the king? The king was from the line of David. But they're going to put the crown on the priest, on the high priest. And this, again, is a sign of the future coming of Christ, the future Messiah who is coming to be both the priest and the king. But again, again, it's conditional because he says in verse 15 at the end, and this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. These things will happen, but only if you obey. So it's conditional. But as we look forward to that hope, as we look forward to that time in the future where great things are coming, where God's power and his glory will be displayed, it is conditional on us. And it was conditional on them. And very, very briefly, I'm going to go through verse, chapter 7 through 8 just really quickly, because he transitions from these visions to a conversation which I find fascinating. They're all sitting around, and for the last 70 years, they've been fasting on regular intervals to commemorate the time when they were taken out of Jerusalem and taken to Babylon. They were fasting, and they asked this question of Zechariah. They says, should I weep and abstain in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? Should we keep grieving? Should we keep fasting? And Jesus responds, or Jesus Zechariah, God through Zechariah responds to them and says, when you fasted in verse 5 of chapter 7, when you fasted and mourned in the 5th and the 7th for the 70 years, was it for me that you fasted? And when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat for yourself and drink for yourself? What he's doing is calling them out. I saw you fasting. Why? There's the why question. 
Why were you fasting? Why were you doing those things? And really, he points out to them that they were being selfish, that they were doing it for themselves. They were worshiping for themselves. And if that's not a lesson that we can lift up our eyes to see here today, I hope you can see that. When you worship, are you worshiping for yourself? Or are you really worshiping for God? Because he says, I know exactly why you were fasting. I know, I know exactly why you were doing these things. And then he goes on, essentially, to say, yes, all of these blessings, all of these great things are going to come to you, but only if you are faithful to the covenant in chapter 8. Only if you stop being like your forefathers. Only if you stop being like them. And he talks about how they needed to focus on mercy and justice and treating others with love, those who were widows, those who were fatherless, those who were strangers, those who were poor. What they really needed to do was not sit around fasting. They needed to get to work in being kind and welcoming and open and serving other people. Now that feels like a message you could just put right in Jesus' mouth, right? That's what he said all the time. Serve others. That's the most important thing. And if you do those things, if you do those things, then yes, I'll be with you. I'll care for you. I'll watch out for you. I will, I will show you mercy. And he says in chapter 7, verse 9, the Lord says, Render true judgments and show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. The, his answer to should we keep fasting is not the, the topic of fasting at all. He says, what you really need to be doing is focusing on serving others with love and kindness and mercy. But as he talks about their fathers who had gone on long before them in verse 12, he says, their hearts were diamond hard. I love that word. They were diamond hard. They couldn't budge at all. They didn't want to move at all. They didn't want to change at all. They were diamond hard. But you need to not be that way because I scattered them and I'll scatter you too. And so then, yes, he does talk in chapter 8 about this amazing prosperity that he is going to bring in verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I am jealous for her with great wrath. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion, and I will dwell with them in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city, and on the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Good days are coming. And that's a different message than we typically hear through the minor prophets. Good days are coming. Lift up your eyes and see the things that are coming, the things that are on the horizon. But if you won't become the kind of people who God wants you to be, then you're not going to be the kind of people who can participate in God's kingdom. It's your choice. It's conditional on you. You can look forward to those days, but if looking forward to those days don't change you, well, then it really hasn't done the work it needed to do in your life. And that is what... Jesus said at the end of Mark chapter 13, knowing that the coming of the Lord is coming, as you look forward to that day, you be ready. You be ready for that day. You be prepared for that day. Live the way you need to live. Do the things you need to do for the right reasons. And so hopefully that encouragement to them is the same encouragement that we need today to be ready for the time that we're waiting for so desperately. As we open the lesson, what are you waiting for? Please take out your songbooks and turn to the number that's been announced. If you are not a child of God this morning, you need to be. Because while we look forward to a day that's coming where our Lord will return, take us home into heaven with him, that day is going to have a very different outcome for you if you don't have a relationship with him. He has dominion over the four corners of the earth. There's no hiding from him. And you will stand in judgment if you do not obey him today. Make your commitment. Put yourself to the work. And give your life to him. Please come as we stand in judgment.